Hey folks, welcome back to another review with yours truly, Sam Healy. Today, we're taking a look at this little fella right here, the Expanse board game from our own Jeff Engelstein. I've known this guy for a long time, and uh, quite frankly, every game that he has put out, I have disliked. This one is based on a rather popular or a trendy, I guess you could say, IP that's going on right now, The Expanse television show. Now, I haven't watched all of the episodes of the first season, but I have watched a few of them, and I, I'm not disliking it. I, I do enjoy it. I like the gritty nature of it. I like the semi-realistic space uh, feel that it has. So, um, I was interested in it. I think it's a cool TV show. Maybe it'll be a cool board game as well. Basically, it's area control. Whoever has the most points wins. Let's get down to the table and I'll show you how it works. Then I'll come back with some final thoughts after that. Generally speaking, the whole point of the game is to get the most points, uh, which are tracked by the CP track down here. The small, slight twist is that it is also the currency that you'll be using to purchase these different cards, carry out their abilities, or use the action points on them during the course of your turn. So uh, this is an economy, but it's also your... Uh, victory points at the end of the game. Whoever has the most victory points once uh, the sixth scoring card is revealed uh, on the track over there, a final scoring round will happen. And then whoever has the most points at the end of that final scoring round is the winner. And of course, there are some tiebreakers in there as well. In order to control these different bases, one will need to have a majority of influence cubes at the base and we all have our own pool of uh, influence cubes that are out there and then fleets that are out here in the orbital sector will actually aid you if you have majority. If you have uh, majority control in the orbital that'll give you plus one influence on each of the bases where you have a presence of influence of an influence cube. On a round, basically when it becomes your turn, uh, you're going to be able to select a card from the track and either keep it or play it for one of two different things. So for example, the action card deck that is over here, and this is the track that is being used, has cards in it that are uh, very similar to this. They have an action point allowance, and then they also have an event that can either be chosen by the person uh, who is choosing cards on their specific turn. If their faction symbol shows up on this row right here, this one just happens to have all four factions, but you can see here, this one's missing the MCR and the protogen faction. So those two players would not be able to choose to do this, but they could choose this card to do that. Uh, so, you can choose to either do the action points or the um, event down here. Now, if you choose to uh, not use the action points and you choose to do this, you have an option. You can pay one victory point here to keep the card and use it at a later time, or you can just go ahead and do it immediately uh, on your present turn. So, for example, during the United Nations first turn, they're going to look at the cards that are over here and basically see if they want to fire off one of those uh, event cards or if they want to use the event card for the action point allowance. The numbers that are here denote how many victory points you have to spend in order to choose that card. Uh, you'll see here that this one is zero for everybody. This one is one for everybody but the United Nations. The United Nations, it's still a zero. So that's their kind of latent special ability is that these two are always free for them. So the cards that are in these spots, they don't ever have to pay for it to fire off. So generally speaking, in the United Nations first turn, maybe they, they're feeling a, a little bit generous here and they spend two points to choose this in order to use the four action points. And so now we go down to see what are the things that they can use their action points for. Well, if they look at our player sheet here, we can move one group of fleets, one band for one action point. We can place one influence cube where we already have a fleet for one action point, or we can build a fleet in our earth orbital 
for one action point. Well, our first turn, all of our fleets are already on the board, so we won't actually be able to do that. So in this first turn, we really have the ability to simply place an influence cube or move our fleets around. So uh, we're going to move our fleet uh, here in Tycho. Uh, we can move it one band or we can just move it to another orbital. It really doesn't matter that way. So we're gonna move one, that's one action point. And then for a second, we're gonna place influence on Vesta. And then we're also gonna place influence on Ceres. Um, and uh, let's see. Yeah, we're gonna go with double on series there, right? So we have one, two, three, four action points. That is the end of my turn. Now, since I did not activate the event of the card that I chose, even though I could have, the persons or or the person or persons who control factions that have things in this row now have the opportunity to fire off that event. So the MCR here is the only other faction. So this one says here, you may move each of your fleets up to one band, including the Rosinate, if controlled. So this might be a good time for the person to fire this off. So he's going to choose to fire it, in which case the MCR's faction token moves all the way down in initiative order and comes over. So he's going to go ahead and do this. He's going to move each of your fleets up to one band, including the Rose State if controlled. So we look over here and he's looking for blue and purple planets. So uh, maybe he wants to move one of his fleets over here to Toth because that is something that uh, he may be wanting to go for. And then the Rosinate here, uh, let's see here. Um, uh, maybe he wants to go up here to Tycho, like so. And that is the extent of the event card. It would then go into a discard pile. Um, and then if there were holes up here, they would shift up. But since the hole is right here, it just simply refills. And now it goes on to the OPA's turn. Now it's actually pretty cool that a scorecard actually just showed up because now we can go over that. Uh, we're just gonna go ahead and say that the United Nations is going to spend two probably wouldn't do that because we're already down there in the back. Uh, and we're gonna go ahead and score. So the first thing that we would do here is we would take one of these bonus uh, sector tiles and choose it. There are two each, outer planets, belts, and inner planets. So we would basically choose one of these and um, as being the bonus sector for this turn. Looks like we're gonna go ahead and choose inner planets. Now, we wouldn't tell anybody what that bonus sector is because now, at this point, every, anybody who kept a card, you know, they paid the one CP for it and kept it to be used at a later date, they would now have the opportunity to uh, use that kept event or uh, the person who controls the Ros uh, Rosinante can fire one of these abilities. So the MCR will go ahead and do that, not knowing what the bonus sector is. He's gonna go ahead and use the James Holden ability and place a uh, influence right there in Ganymede. So that's that. Now we would score each base. So we flip over the bonus sector and we chose the inner planets. So the inner planet sector here is going to score each, the person who has the most influence on the base scores two points, and then the person in second place scores one point. So here in the inner planets, uh, Blue would score because he is looking for food planets. He would score three points for this one, two points here, and two points here because he has orbital dominance, that gives him plus one influence on the base. So he would move up to 13. Then down here, Mars would actually be scoring uh, none of their uh, planets. Well, I'm sorry, there is one here. So he would be scoring three points and uh, two points for this one. So that's five. And we also forgot Protogen does also get one point for being second place. Uh, up there in Luna. So there you have that. And then we go ahead and score the other two. The inner planets are done. And now we score all of the other 
sectors at the normal scoring rate, which is each person in first place gets one and then zero, zero for second and third place. The OPA gets uh, one point. Here, the OPA gets one point as well. So that's two for the OPA. Here, um, the uh, UN would get two points because this is a planet, a mineral planet that they're wanting to get. So that's one, two. And then down here in Eros, the protogen, that is a planet that they are trying to get as well. So they get two points. And then over here, Toth, same thing, two more points, like so. Over here in Jupiter, Mars would get, let's see here, they are looking for water planets and purple planets, so that's going to give them two points. And then Ganymede gets them one point. And then Eo gives Protogen one point as well. Down here in Saturn, the UN is looking for food, so that gets them two points up to here. And then the rings gives them just one point up to here. Now, down here on Titan, however, we have a tie for influence. So we look at the orbital, and there is also a tie for orbital control as well. So there is actually no bonus made here, so they both get second place, which in this part which in the normal sectors is still just zero. So there's actually no points awarded for that one. After we score each base, we then gain a new faction tech. And so after everybody has gained that new faction tech, we would all be able to build one fleet if we have that necessary thing where we have fleets available to them. And then after that, we determine who has Rosinate control. The person who is in last place gains the Rosinante. And so we're gonna go ahead and move this over here. And now they have control over the Rosinante. If there is a tie for last place, then it goes to whoever is lowest in initiative order over here. And then once that scoring phase is done, we flip over another card and we continue in clockwise order. And you do that until the sixth scoring card is revealed. At that point, you score a final uh, round, and then whoever has the most points at the end of that final scoring round is the winner. So that is the Expanse board game from Jeff Engelstein and WizKids. Now, first things first, did I like the game? <laughs> Actually, yes. I finally like a Jeff Engelstein game. One of the things that I really enjoyed about the Expanse is simply the fact at how easy it is to teach and how easy it is to learn and how easy it is to play. There isn't a whole lot of convolution with uh, timed elements here and, and doing things as fast as you can over here. You actually, it's a, it's a strategy game. You're, you're really able to kind of, I mean, it's tense, don't get me wrong. In some cases, uh, maybe you don't want to go after that planet. Maybe that planet isn't one of the ones that scores you more points, but you want to take those points away from your opponent. So, yeah, I'm going to fight you over here. No, I don't need it. It's, it's not something that I'm really looking forward to. But, yeah, I'm going to take those points away from you. I like those kinds of games. Now, of course, they have to be played in a rather lighthearted manner because you don't want to be, you know, getting angry and agitated at your players. But it does have that very tense feeling to it where... Almost at any point, uh, your, your plans can kind of be foiled, not by some random event, but by the good play of one of your opponents. And I really like when games do that. From what I do know about the TV show, all of the different factions have asymmetrical abilities that seem to fit rather well into how the TV show uh, projects or portrays those different factions. So from that aspect, I think there is a good level of thematic inclusion that goes on here with those different variable player powers. And while we're there, man, do I like it when games have variable player powers. Really enjoy that because it makes me feel different than everybody else. So that's a very cool thing there. Now, one of the things that I wasn't too keen on was the graphic design of the game. The graphic design is functional. 
and it is clear in how the board is laid out. And some of the parts of the board, the different legends on the board, for example, the scoring legend, that was really helpful because it laid out for you in pretty well-mannered uh, detail what, each, what you did during each scoring phase. So I liked that. I thought it was very clear and it was very functional. But it was also very bland. There was not a whole lot of aesthetically pleasing things about this game. Even the cards themselves, while they were very functional, had simply production stills uh, from the TV show for their artwork. And I think that's okay most of the time. But given the choice, I'd much rather have an artistic rendering uh, from a very talented artist putting in their work on these different cards rather than just production stills. Again, I'm, I'm really one of those kinds of guys that doesn't mind production stills at all. It helps me connect with the IP, whatever it might be, uh, a little bit easier. But that having been said, I also know that there are a lot of other people out there that don't like production stills at all and would actually turn them off from the game. So I think that's a downswing that, that the game has produced. The graphic design left something to be desired. But thankfully, it didn't bring my attention away from how the game plays and the fun and the interaction that happens within the game. So that's a bonus. All in all, I think this is a great area control game that I have really enjoyed. And it was a surprise because as I said earlier, I haven't liked a lot of Jeff's games. I do like this one a lot. And I think it's, it's simply because it's easy to teach, easy to play. Um, and uh, on your turn, you have a very limited number of decisions that you have to make, but those decisions that you do need to make are very important. I like the decisions that you have to make. I like the choices that are there because they're simple choices, but they're very meaningful choices and they can resonate a lot within the rest of the gameplay. Choosing when to score is also a difficult decision to make. Do you wanna score now and just kind of cut your losses? Or do you wanna wait and build up on this planet and then hopefully nobody else scores, it comes back to you and now you can pick the bonus sector. I'm gonna give this one two thumbs way, way, way up because I really enjoyed it and it really came out of left field for me. Um, I was familiar with the IP, but I also knew that I usually don't like Jeff's games. So it was really cool to finally have those two connect, an IP that I'm interested in and having a game from Jeff that I actually do enjoy now. So we've crossed a milestone, Jeff. There you have it. Well, that's it from me for The Expanse, the board game. We'll see you guys on the flip side. <laughs>